Hello, and thank you for joining me today. I'm excited to be at the City Match Conference for 2020. And hey, it's a virtual conference this year, so that means I can probably take off my mask. Um, I'm excited that you decided to watch this video. PowerPoint slides are awesome, but I feel like this is a really exciting collaboration that I'd like to tell you about. And so um, having a video to kind of walk through that feels like a really good format for me. So I hope this is enjoyable. So what I'd like to talk about today is a collaboration that brings together high quality referrals for contraception, emergency contraception and abortion, and the pharmacy profession. My name is Anna Pfaff. I'm a trainer and outreach coordinator with PROVIDE. PROVIDE is a national nonprofit and we have about 25 years experience working in the field of reproductive health. Our current focus is on training and technical assistance tools that combat stigma and improve referrals for unintended pregnancy and abortion. And I have no disclosures to make. I'd like to start just really briefly with the three topics we're gonna talk about contraception, emergency contraception, and abortion. The reason that we focus on these topics is that they are all crucial components to comprehensive reproductive health care, maternal child health. They're all stigmatized. And there are laws which dictate access to these products which vary by state. And also we know that there are recognized disparities in access to these services based on race, geography, and social determinants of health. In addition to that, I think it's important to remember a couple of current events and barriers that we need to be mindful of that may impact the way that people access these three services. So first of all, Title X changes, right? Um, as of 2019, about a quarter of Title X grantees are no longer using those Title X funds for uh, contraception, in part because of the prohibition related to abortion referrals. We also know in 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that employers can opt out of the Affordable Care Act's birth control mandate over religious or moral objections. Mapping as of 2020 identified large areas of the country as contraceptive deserts, which leaves millions of people who need publicly funded contraception without a real reasonable um, way to access that. And then finally, COVID, right, has disrupted um, so much of our lives but also has impacted supply chains, limited access to medical and social services, and then simultaneously increased concerns about desired fertility and family size. So given all that, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk specifically about reproductive health information and referrals. And just as a quick refresher, because this is uh, provide really talks about this a lot. It's really important to remember that research in health and human service field shows that a supportive and effective recommendation from a provider can help prevent delays in accessing care and the subsequent health outcomes. So this is an important place to start in this conversation. I'd also like to introduce the pharmacists, right? The pharmacy profession. Um, as a key puzzle piece in accessing reproductive health care. So I will also admit, I am not a pharmacist. Um, but starting in 2019, based on a couple of trends that we were seeing in things like emergency contraception and the access to that, um, abortion referrals, as I mentioned, um, medication abortion delivery, all of these things, provide started to look more closely at the role of the pharmacist within the healthcare team. So you can see here, pharmacy touches a lot of places. They are a trusted source in over-the-counter family planning supplies like pregnancy tests and condoms, emergency contraception. Um, pharmacists also work along other, alongside other healthcare providers. Um, they dispense misoprostol, which has multiple uses in obstetric and abortion care and other reproductive health medications. You may not know this, but pharmacists in 12 states are currently permitted by statewide protocol um, to prescribe and dispense hormonal contraception directly to patients in the pharmacy setting. Additionally, there are four other states in the District of Columbia that are in the process of similarly expanding access. And finally, the pharmacist, again, as you can see in this picture, interfaces with the larger healthcare team by providing information and counseling, 
uh, triage referrals for the patient that they serve. Some of their advantages of the pharmacy is that they're local, right? They're nearby. Most people in this country live about five miles from a pharmacy, and that may not be true for uh, a, a healthcare provider. They are a stigma-free location, which means that um, I can walk there and I can walk in and, and buy toenail polish or depression medication. Um, and it's just sort of an easier place to walk into than it may be for someone to walk into um, a clinic. They often offer clinical expertise. They have extended hours, meaning that they're open generally longer than the work day. And as I mentioned, they do have increased capacity. So improving access at the pharmacy level can look like a lot of different things. So here's an example. Um, we just mentioned that condoms, emergency contraception, or um, pregnancy tests are available over the counter, but just selling these products isn't really enough. Um, pharmacists have uh, the capacity to kind of take a next step. And what that can look like is displaying these products in, in front of the counter um, with signage that encourages a patient to ask questions and seek expertise from the pharmacy professionals in a way that doesn't increase stigma that can sometimes be associated with those products. Another example would be getting patients more familiar with pharmacist prescribed contraceptives. If this is an option in their area, promoting the service through social media and pharmacy materials can improve access to a local source for contraceptive counseling and prescription. And while these two examples might seem really straightforward, in order to make really measurable change in the professions, um, it's important to have the structures in place that support that change. So once Provide started looking at this role of the pharmacist as a key player, we realized that there are no standardized trainings or technical assistance tools for pharmacists about making high quality referrals for family planning and pregnancy. So that brought us to this next exciting part of the story, which is this collaboration between Provide and a nationally recognized expert in the field, which is birth control pharmacist. So I mentioned, as I mentioned, I work for Provide. Provide has an expertise in training for um, health and human service workers to make comprehensive client-centered abortion, abortion referrals through training and technical assistance. And birth control pharmacists hosts a web platform that supports pharmacy staff in providing reproductive health services and advancing policy. So I'd just like to walk you through what this collaboration looked like. So uh, beginning in 2019, how did we do this? Um, provide reach out to birth control pharmacists and said, hey, we are interested in creating a toolkit for the pharmacy profession to talk about making high quality referrals and giving information on emergency contraception and abortions. Training and technical assistance is what we were focusing on. And then beginning in March of 2020, we collaborated to create a one hour webinar that is right here, meeting reproductive health needs at the pharmacy. And the project's goals are to shift, shift attitudes, knowledge and behaviors among pharmacy staff on reproductive health services um, to improve the delivery of client-centered referrals and um, ultimately to expand the scope of professionals who can competently address reproductive health needs. So I would encourage you to check out this, uh, the link here, and to share it with your colleagues. So our program outline covered uh, three basic parts. We talked about some of the barriers and um, facts related to reproductive health. We introduced best practices in combating stigma. And we, oh, we also lo looked at local resources. So for example, um, when we talk about stigma, based on our two sets of expertise, we created some professional recommendations for pharmacists to reduce stigma. So as an example for this, we talked about reducing individual level stigma, one-on-one -on -one stigma, by integrating national referrals resources into pharmacy practice. And some of the national referral resources that we highlighted are birth control pharmacies, which talks about pharmacist prescribed birth control, 
provide referrals, which is a list of abortion providers nationally. All Options, which offers telephone support for folks who need support around all options for their pregnancy. And Bedsider, which offers a number of different um, searchable databases for providers. We also created technical assistance tools specifically for the pharmacy. That includes um, an environmental checklist and then a referrals, um, referrals guide. And we included resources for further learning to build capacity within a pharmacy team. So we talked about topics such as medication abortion, um, emergency contraception, pregnancy options counseling, supervising staff that make referrals, and then making quality abortion care referrals. So we launched this webinar actually earlier this month. Um, and we started with a synchronous training, which was on September 2nd. And to be clear, this um, learning tool will be available asynchronously for at-home learning for the next three years and is available for continuing pharmacy education. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what we learned from our initial cohort. We had 125 participants register. We had 70 participants attend. And then we had 40 as of um, about three days after the webinar, we had um, about 40 participants who had completed the pre and the post survey. We had participants from all over the country. We had quite a few from the West Coast, but quite a few from the East Coast as well. So we had a pretty good representation geographically. We had a pretty good representation of practice settings. So including chain pharmacies, independent pharmacies, um, academia, we had a lot of different folks there. We had a number of different professional roles represented, mainly pharmacists, 80% right? were pharmacists. So now I'd like to talk about some of the pre and the post data that we collected from our initial cohort. First question we asked in a pre and a post is how people felt in their willingness to help a patient access these three services, contraception, emergency contraception, and abortion. And so what you see here is in our pre, um, in our pre and our post, we saw an incline on all three of those, right? So we had a 15% increase in willingness to help a patient access both contraception and emergency contraception, and a 24% increase in willingness to help a patient access abortion following the webinar. Same thing, we asked about self-reported skill helping a patient access these three services. So again, you can see an uptick on all three of those. We saw for contraception, we saw a 53% increase in skill related to accessing contraception for a patient, a 25% increase in skill or perceived skill in helping a patient access emergency contraception and an 80% increase in skill helping a patient access abortion. We wanted to know what was currently happening in pharmacy practice. So again, according to our pre-survey, we know that 63% of our participants were offering emergency contraception over the counter. 32 were able to prescribe contraception and eight were providing abortion referrals. 8% were providing abortion referrals. And at the close of the webinar, we asked, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do differently? So this graph shows that. We, um, we saw 5% report that they were going to add um, making emergency contraception over the counter available at their pharmacy. But just to keep in mind, that number was pretty high to begin with. People were already doing that pretty frequently. 27% said that they would include pharmacy prescribed contraception as part of their services and 47% said that they would include abortion referrals in their practice going forward. So we also asked people how they felt, right? Not just their numbers, but what did they have to say about the training? So you can see on this quote from a participant that this felt really useful for them, um, not only for them, but for their colleagues to make sure that they have good reproductive health competencies so that they can increase the options for accessibility for the patients that they work with. 
We also saw that there are some pharmacists who are aware of upcoming capacity expansion in their states. And as a result of this, they felt like the counseling skills that they learned in this webinar were really useful, as well as some of the practical skills, as I mentioned, the uh, searchable database, as mentioned, provides searchable database to find abortion referrals would be really useful as their capacity expands. And then finally, we heard from some students that this was really useful for them. So folks currently in practice, but that they hope to pursue work in women's health and they thought that this would be really valuable in the scope of their career, which is all really good to hear. Okay, so we'd like to talk about some of the bigger picture things, some of the things that we accomplished as a result of this um, collaboration. First of all, we got really positive feedback from people who participated. You saw some of that. We also know that some of the technical assistance materials, I mentioned the environmental checklist um, and the referrals guide, we know that some of those are already being used in practice in academic, academia, um, potentially elsewhere. And we also are really excited to have a forthcoming publication that will be able to share this information with the broader pharmacy community. Some of the barriers in the collaboration are worth noting. These may be familiar to you, right? Timeline, budget, and capacity. I feel like every collaboration is really up against this, but I think uh, perhaps to be more specific, our timeline was originally supposed to be three months to create this webinar, and then COVID happened, uh, and our capacity was really, really limited. Um, our budget was really limited for this project as well. We had about $3,000. To, uh, to create this material and fully half of that went to the continuing education credits that we, um, that we felt were really valuable and needed for pharmacy professionals. We learned some lessons. Uh, first of all, timeline has to be flexible, right? We had to be flexible in what we were doing, especially in the face of a pandemic. We had to really narrow our content. Both of, uh, both of our organizations have expertise um, in a lot of different things. And so really narrowing things down to an hour took some whittling. And then finally, we realized that there is interest from the field, not only from the pharmacy field, but from the broader public health field and how to integrate pharmacies and pharmacists into the, um, the big picture. Okay, so this is the last little section. Where is this going to take us, right? Where will we, where will we go next? So first of all, we'd like to really promote these materials. Uh, we don't want them just to sit somewhere and collect dust. We think they're really valuable. We know they're really valuable from our evaluation. We're going to share our resources through publications, as I mentioned, and conferences just like this. And we also are really encouraging professionals to integrate environmental checklists and referral guides into their clinical practice. So I mentioned those technical assistance tools. Um, we really wanna make sure that they're used. We wanna capture practice change because we know it's great to have a tool, but we really wanna see what the impact of it is in changing, um, changing referrals practice, changing practice. So we're gonna monitor and record changes in attitudes, skills, and behaviors. Um, and just to be actually clear on this, something else that's important to know is that um, we'll also be collecting longitudinal data in addition to that pre and post. We'll be looking at data from about three months out from participants from that original cohort to gauge what practice change has happened and maybe identify any further resources that they need. We really want to reach the areas of highest need. So we want to consider equity. We want to consider ways to make these resources available to professionals across the country. So that means that we want to expand the reach of training and technical assistance through grants and partnerships. I think that's really, really crucial. And we want to explore collaborations with pharmacies. And this could look like co-located pharmacies at health centers. This could look like collaborations with health departments for collaborative practice agreements. Um, this could look like work with rural health, but we want to make sure, again, that that conversation is happening between all of public health, including pharmacists. We want to standardize education. We want to add referrals, best practices to pharmacy curriculum. As I mentioned, this is not part of the pharmacy curriculum currently. And we want to promote pharmacy continuing education. So for incoming professionals into the field or, or current professionals in the field, we want to make sure that this is part of their training. 
And finally, we want to really encourage big picture change. And that could be encouraging state pharmacy boards to support pharmacists to practice to the top of their training so that they are really able to meet the needs of patients at any place that they seek care, be it the health center, uh, be it a health department, their private doctor's office, or at the pharmacy. So with that, I will close, but just wanted to give a shout out to my co-collaborator, Sally Raffi. She is um, in charge of the Birth Control Pharmacist Project. You have her contact information there if you would like to reach out to her. Again, my name is Anna Pfaff. I work with Provide, and you have my contact information here. I really appreciate your time today, and I hope that this webinar was useful for you. Thank you so much.